to this session on uh, uh, the discussion we'll have here about the challenges of the growing internal internationalization of uh, cartel investigations. Uh, my name is Jose Regazzini. I'm a partner at the law firm Tosini Freire in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and the chair of the Antitrust Committee of the International Bar Association. It's my pleasure to be here today and an honor to introduce uh, the speakers of our panel this morning. Uh, I will start with Mr. Andrei Sarikovsky, Deputy Head of the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service of the Russian Federation in Moscow. On my far left side, uh, Mr. Vasily Rodomino, Senior Partner at the Auroad Law Firm in Moscow and a member of the Council of the Legal Practices Division of the International Bar Association. On my right side, Mr. Gary Spratling, a partner at the Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher Law Firm in San Francisco. And on my uh, left, Mr. Michael Reynolds, a partner at uh, Allenover in Brussels and the president of the International Bar Association. Uh, I, I'm sure we'll have a very uh, interesting and enlightening discussion here today. Uh, this is a moment uh, where in every jurisdiction the fight against cartels uh, is a very important topic. I'm sure in Russia, as it is in Brazil, my country, this is also a very important uh, question and issue to be discussed. Uh, before we move into our first speaker, I would like Mr. Michael Reynolds to say a few words as the president of the IBA. Michael. Thank you very much, um, Jose. Um, the IBA's antitrust section is one of our most active uh, sections in the IBA. And uh, every year at our many conferences uh, focuses on the issue of cartel enforcement, which has become a really international uh, phenomenon. But it's a great pleasure to be speaking at this session and having this session here um, in uh, the third international St. Petersburg Forum. This is one of the three sessions that the International Bar Association is putting on during the forum. Uh, and when we were discussing back in November with the Ministry of Justice what subjects would be most appropriate, this subject of international uh, cartel enforcement was one of the prominently suggested subjects. Um, and I think that reflects the importance of that subject here in Russia as well as around the world. And it's a great pleasure to be taking part in this with Mr. Sarikovsky from the uh, Federalny Antimonopolny Shlujba, the uh, Federal Antimonopoly Office. Uh, we have a, a great record of uh, cooperating in the IBA with the Antimonopoly Office um, and meetings with Mr. Artemyev and... Uh, uh, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Office has been hugely supportive of IBA programs um, and has sent speakers to many of our programs around the world, such as the uh, recent conference we had on the uh, BRICS countries in London. So I'm delighted uh, that uh, this is taking place and to be here. Um, when I started practicing antitrust law in Brussels, uh, which was <coughs> quite a long time ago, um, there were only about three jurisdictions you would think about in terms of, of cartel enforcement. Obviously, the United States, perhaps Canada, United Kingdom, um, and uh, Germany, and, and the EU in a, in a rather nascent way. And what we've seen um, over the time is a, is a really colossal expansion of um, the enforcement of cartel, um, uh, anti-cartel measures around the world. We've seen... Um, the, in the BRICS countries, for example, you now have very fully-fledged competition regimes in countries like India, uh, in China, um, and uh, there are about 70 countries now with uh, very active antitrust enforcement, including in the cartel area, and the adoption of leniency uh, programs. And we've seen around the world the fines get heavier, fines not only uh, in the European Union, which, where, where we don't have criminal sanctions, but also in countries um, uh, like uh, Japan, as you saw recently in the wire harness case in Japan, very heavy fines, Korea, uh, Australia, where they also now have criminal sanctions, Brazil, which also has criminal sanctions. So the whole um, 
enforcement mechanism has become much more uh, serious. And that's been fed, really, I think, by two phenomena. One is the, is the increased adoption of leniency programs, which has given regulators around the world much more information uh, about cartels, because the great challenge for the regulators is to actually find out what is happening. Cartels, by their very nature, are often secretly um, put into operation with codes and uh, are disguised um, entities, and, and therefore it's often very difficult to find out that cartels are taking place. And the leniency program, which we'll be explaining, has given the regulators the means to get the basic information to mount those investigations. And all, all the other phenomenon is really a greater cooperation uh, between the regulators themselves. We've seen that in the International Competition Network. We've seen it in the uh, uh, annual competition workshops, which the regulators organized amongst themselves, and in the many uh, bilateral um, memorandums of understanding which there are between the various antitrust regulators. And so there has been a, a, an enormous increase in the amount of information that's exchanged in cooperation, even to the extent of jointly coordinated um, dawn raids and surprise raids around the world, which, for example, we saw very clearly in the Marine Hose case and we saw uh, in the, um, the um, air, car air cargo case. Uh, very closely coordinated um, investigations um, operated between several authorities around the world. So, I think that sets the scene. Um, I think Gary Spratling is going to be our first speaker. I would like to say Gary Spratling, when he was at the Department of Justice before he went into private practice, really uh, was the person in the United States government who, who suggested the leniency program as a mechanism uh, to um, crack cartels, to find cartels, giving companies immunity and individuals immunity from prosecution in return for uh, information uh, that would enable the Department of Justice to really uh, investigate and, and uh, take action against cartels. And he started that in 1993, and really from that, the leniency program got going in the United States and then spread to the European Union and to many other countries around the world. So Gary really, in many ways, was an architect of this um, leniency program phenomenon, which has really transformed the whole uh, face of cartel, uh, anti-cartel enforcement around the world. So, Gary, would you like to tell us a little bit about that and, uh, and your whole approach to uh, uh, I'd be happy to, Michael, and let me first uh, thank you for the kind words. And uh, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, I'd like to start by expressing my appreciation for the opportunity uh, to participate in this uh, international legal forum in this wonderful city of St. Petersburg. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, let me outline what uh, I intend to cover uh, in my remarks uh, this morning uh, so you know what's coming. Uh, first, uh, I would like uh, to um, tell, tell you a few things about the status of anti-cartel enforcement uh, in the United States. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to give you a brief history as to how the U.S. Department of Justice became such a powerful anti-cartel enforcer. It did not happen overnight. In fact, it almost didn't happen. Uh, and the history is instructive as to some of the internationalization issues that we'll be discussing this morning. Uh, third, I'd like to discuss uh, today's enforcement environment, which includes an international network of numerous anti-cartel enforcement authorities, uh, an expanding array of jurisdictions offering leniency uh, 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 protection uh, for those that self-report, uh, and high levels of cross-jurisdictional coordination in international investigations. Then I will review very briefly, and depending upon the time, uh, may even skip this, but um, review very briefly the steps a company takes in assessing its international cartel exposure and deciding what decision it makes when it has exposure. And the reason for looking at this is because it's in that process 
that a company first appreciates the issues of internationalization that we're going to be talking about today. And finally, I'm going to reserve most of my time to the discussion of two particular challenges. The title of this, this section is the titles, is the, is the challenges uh, 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 posed by growing internationalization. And I'm going to look at two in particular. And the first, first is the cumulative costs of self-reporting and cooperation with multiple jurisdictions if you've chosen a global strategy of cooperating with enforcers. Uh, and the second is managing the civil litigation costs of cooperation. So that's an outline of what uh, I hope to cover. Uh, so let's start with the, with the first um, uh, item, uh, which is the state of cartel enforcement uh, in the United States. Uh, probably all of you know that a cartel violation or infringement in the United States is a crime. Individuals are subject to a maximum sentence of up to 10 years in jail and a fine of up to $1 million. Since the Department of Justice, uh, through the 1990s in cartel prosecutions, 80% of all defendants, no matter what country was their home country, 80% of all defendants prosecuted in the United States went to jail uh, for their uh, cartel offenses. Corporations are subject to a maximum fine of uh, $100 million, or there's something called an alternative, alternative fine statute where you can be subject to a fine of double the gain to the cartelists or double the loss to the victims of the crime. Um, and the fact that uh, $100 million uh, does not represent uh, much of a limit uh, uh, is indicated by the fact that the Department of Justice has obtained fines of over 100 million times uh, 20 in 20 different uh, cartel cases. Uh, looking at the year 2012, uh, the Antitrust Division filed 67 criminal cases for cartel offenses. They obtained jail sentences against 45 individuals. The average length of those jail sentences was 26 months, uh, with one sentence of four years. It obtained average jail sentences against foreign individuals, that is, individuals who did not reside in the United States. Average jail sentences against foreign individuals of 16 months, including two 36-month sentences against Taiwanese nationals for their participation in the LCD flat screen uh, cartel, and two sentences or sentences of 24 months each against two Japanese individuals for their participation in the auto parts uh, cartel. The Department of Justice secured $1.3 billion in fines, including $220 million uh, in restitution. Uh, but as you will hear when Michael speaks about the European Union, um, uh, the Department of Justice in the United States is actually a weakling uh, compared to the European Commission uh, in terms of the fines uh, that are collected. The Department of Justice uh, last year also won all of its criminal trials, that is those defendants that did not settle but went to trial, won all of its criminal trials, including a eight-week trial against AU uh, Optronics um, and its executives uh, for its role uh, in the LCD uh, flat screen uh, cartel. Uh, and the uh, court imposed a fine at the end of that trial of $500 million uh, against the uh, company. Uh, and uh, although the Department of Justice, you might be interested to know, requested a fine of $1 billion uh, against the company. So uh, how is it that the uh, U.S. Department of Justice rose to such a powerful uh, anti-cartel enforcer? There were four factors. The first factor was the uh, implementation of a new leniency policy uh, that following a rather uncertain start uh, became so successful 
after a number of years that it became a model for leniency policies uh, around the world. And we're going to come back to the leniency policy because of how important that was. But continuing now uh, with respect to the other three factors, the second was an increasing threat of severe sanctions, which was the result of the use of the alternative fine statute that I just, just mentioned, the highly publicized fines of $100 million against uh, Archer Daniels Midland uh, in 1996, and the fines of $500 million and $225 million against Hoffman Roach and BASF in the Vitamins Cartel in 1999. Those fines may not sound high now, but when they were imposed in 1996 and 1999, they were blockbusters. There had never been anything like that type of fine in the world uh, for uh, anti-competitive activity. The third factor was a growing risk of detention, uh, of detection. Um, and that occurred because uh, of the broader use of the Department of Justice's uh, various um, uh, types of investigatory powers, uh, the implementation of something that's called the Amnesty Plus program, uh, which I don't have time to describe now, uh, and just the synergy created by the leniency program itself and the number of people who began to come forward under the leniency program created a risk in the minds of those who weren't coming forward that, they, that there might be detection. And lastly, the last factor was the greater prob prob uh, predictability of treatment uh, under the leniency program. Uh, this was very important to the development of the program um, in that people would know what would happen to them if they come in under the program and also would know the consequences if they didn't. Um, coincidentally, uh, or I guess actually it's not so coincidentally, officials of the Antitrust Division have been saying for several years now that the last three factors that I just mentioned, uh, namely the threat of severe sanctions for cartel behavior, the perceived risk of detention, of detection, for people who don't come in under the leniency program, and the predictability of your treatment if you come in and the consequences if you don't, those three factors are critical to the success of any leniency program. Those three factors are critical to providing the incentive to a company to make the decision to come in and admit a violation uh, in a, a cartel. And this is relevant to questions that many of us get at international conferences. When people from jurisdictions, both enforcers and practitioners from jurisdictions say, we have a leniency program in our jurisdiction, but it's not working. It is not bringing in people to confess about international cartels. That's because you need those three factors before a leniency program uh, will work. Uh, let's go back to that first factor, uh, the, the leniency program uh, in the United States. You know, now uh, that, that uh, the DOJ leniency policy um, has become a synonymous with effective cartel enforcement over the last 20 years, uh, and indeed uh, there are an ever-expanding number of jurisdictions um, in the high 50s now number of jurisdictions that offer uh, leniency policies, it's actually hard to think back and recall and appreciate what a revolutionary development the Department of Justice leniency program was. Uh, at, the, at the time that the Department of Justice's revised leniency program was put in place, as Michael said, in 1993. The U.S. Department of Justice had had a leniency program for 14 years before that. It was a complete failure. In 1993, there was only one other country in the world 
besides the United States that had a competition leniency program, and that was Canada. There were no others. And so the uh, U.S. DOJ uh, developed this leniency program that was completely transparent, that provided for automatic leniency for qualifying companies that came in before there was a government investigation. It also provided for the opportunity for leniency even after an investigation had begun. And lastly, whether it was automatic leniency or leniency after investigation had begun, if the company was granted leniency, then all officers, directors, and employees of that company who cooperated in the investigation in assisting the department's investigation would also receive a leniency. These three elements, that is automatic leniency, leniency after investigation had begun, and finally, protection for all officers, directors, and employees. Those three elements did not exist in any voluntary disclosure program anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world. And in that sense, it was revolutionary. It was so revolutionary that the policy met great resistance within the Department of Justice. This was a proposal of the Antitrust Division. It met huge resistance within the Department of Justice. And when it was initially announced, it was not accepted by the, the uh, business or legal communities because no one thought that the Antitrust Division would live up to the deal. No one believed it was possible that if you came in and admitted this, that you would actually get automatic leniency. And in addition to getting automatic leniency, that all the officers, directors, and employees would uh, also receive leniency. Well, uh, we persuaded the rest of the Department of Justice, that is, we, when I was with the Antitrust Division, we persuaded the rest of the Department of Justice uh, that it made sense uh, for, to give leniency even though that you were giving immunity to the company and even though you were giving immunity to all the individuals who participated in this egregious cartel, it was critical for destabilizing the cartel and to cause, to cause the cartelists to turn on one another and to come and report themselves. It was critical to do that, otherwise cartels would go undetected as they had uh, for, for, for decades before that. And then with respect to the we, convincing the business and legal communities, um, we went out and we made speeches day after day, week after week, promising those two groups that we would live up to the deal and challenging them to say, if you don't believe us, then test us. We promise that in every single instance where there is an issue, we will tilt in favor of the applicant, we will tilt in favor of granting immunity, and we will grant immunity. Uh, gradually, uh, companies and lawyers began to make applications. It did not happen overnight. There were a couple of years when there was almost no activity under the initial leniency program. But then soon after the, the, there were leniency applications and those examples of applications became publicized and people saw that companies that came in were getting no fines and the individuals weren't going to jail and others were experiencing massive fines. In the case of vitamins, $500 million, which at the time was enormous uh, for a fine. Then it began to get traction and there developed almost this watershed uh, of, of, of applications uh, that came in. And once that happened, once that happened, uh, then other jurisdictions uh, began to ask the Department of Justice for assistance in developing their own leniency program, which of course the Department of Justice was more than happy to do because it realized that in order to be an effective enforcer against cartel activity, it could not act alone as a jurisdiction. The only way 
that enforcement authorities could ever be truly effective against cartels is to join together and to coordinate in anti-cartel enforcement. To show you what, what a, a, what a um, uh, turning event this was in the history of cartel enforcement, before 1993, the U.S. Department of Justice had only three international cartel investigations. It had no international cartel prosecutions. Neither did any other country. And yet, in just a few years, the Department of Justice had already advanced to 50, that's 5-0, 50 active international cartel investigations uh, and a string of international cartel prosecutions uh, that you uh, have all read about, about uh, and are very well known. So that's what a turning point uh, the uh, leniency policy uh, in the United States was. So now, what do we have today? Today we've got an enforcement environment uh, that is, uh, represents an international network of coordinating anti-cartel uh, authorities. Uh, uh, in addition to the United States, uh, the European Commission, the UK, Canada, Japan, Korea, Australia, and Brazil are very active in international cartel enforcement. And by active in international cartel enforcement, as distinguished from domestic cartel enforcement, uh, what I'm referring to is bringing, bringing cases against foreign companies and or bringing cases against foreign conduct that has an effect in your jurisdiction, uh, what is sometimes called extraterritorial jurisdiction. That's what we refer to when we mean international cartel prosecutions. In addition to the eight jurisdictions that I just mentioned, there are another 10 jurisdictions uh, that have be, or so uh, that have begun international uh, cartel uh, prosecutions uh, or are on the cusp uh, of that. In addition, as I've already mentioned a couple of times this morning, there are over 50 uh, jurisdictions uh, that have leniency policies. Um, enforcement authorities um, uh, are making use of waivers, uh, which is an informal method of international cooperation, but it is a method by which more information is exchanged than all the formal methods of international cooperation combined. Because under the principle of a waiver, which can be granted informally by a leniency applicant to two pairs, uh, two pairs of jurisdictions. Um, with the permission of the leniency applicant, one jurisdiction can share with another jurisdiction all of the information that the leniency applicant has, applied, has provided uh, to either one uh, of those jurisdictions. We've also seen um, in one international cartel investigation after another, and certainly in nearly all of the large investigations, a high degree of coordination among um, anti-cartel enforcement uh, authorities, um, including the coordination of uh, inspections, raids, searches, uh, drop-in interviews uh, among four or five or six major enforcement authorities. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, the, co the coordination of dozens of national and local police authorities who assist in the various raids um, and, um, um, and searches. Uh, in addition to that, the International Competition Network, uh, is, which is an organization of more than uh, 100 uh, competition authorities, uh, regularly um, uh, addresses uh, increased uh, coordination and cooperation among enforcement authorities uh, and facilitates uh, that type of cooperation. So we are talking about truly, we are talking about a network. We are talking about um, the um, internationalization uh, of uh, cartel investigations. And it's in that environment that one makes the decision 
if one represents a company or one is a company, it's in that environment that one makes the decision of what to do when you have international cartel exposure. Uh, there, are, there are several steps um, um, to uh, making that decision, uh, but in light of the uh, time, uh, I'm only going to focus on a couple of those steps. Uh, there, are there are critical steps um, uh, because uh, they take us, they tee up the issues that I want uh, to discuss. But one of the steps in deciding what to do is to identify and, the, and evaluate the opportunities to mitigate the sanctions. This is after you've gone through and determined what the sanctions might be, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, for the cartel activity in which you've engaged. You then look at what are the opportunities to mitigate those, those, um, those sanctions. And in, do, and in doing that, one of the things that you do is you project the costs of self-reporting. And I'm gonna discuss that in just a moment. Another step that you take when you're determining what you're going to do as a global strategy uh, is to analyze the civil litigation costs and the civil litigation exposure of cooperating with government authorities in one or more jurisdictions. Also a very important step, you see, because what, you, what you're doing in this process is you're trying to determine what the net global benefit of cooperation is. Net global benefit is both the starting point and the ending point of a company when it engages in the risk analysis to determine what to do when it has uh, uh, cartel exposure. So turning now to the challenges that are posed by growing uh, internationalization of cartel investigations, um, let, me, let me address uh, the, the, the two challenges that, uh, that I said I would. And the first of those uh, is the cumulative costs of self-reporting uh, and cooperation um, under, a, um, uh, under a global strategy uh, of uh, cooperating uh, with enforcement authorities, assuming that's the decision you've reached after you've gone through the analysis of um, all the steps, which is a more detailed analysis than we have time for this morning. Uh, the when a company is evaluating uh, the leniency or immunity uh, alternative as an international strategy, one of the questions is what would be the cumulative burden of self-reporting and cooperating in multiple jurisdictions? Uh, I am firmly of the view that the expansion of leniency policies to 50 plus jurisdictions is a very positive development, both with respect to international cartel enforcement and with respect to companies with international cartel exposure considering what they're going to do. However, the sheer number of jurisdictions relevant to a company considering the alternatives coupled with the increasing requirements that are being placed upon cooperators by many jurisdictions in order to satisfy the condition of full, complete, continuing cooperation have been resulting in costs that are just enormous. Uh, costs so great that they can dissuade, they can discourage a company from self-reporting in any jurisdiction, and certainly those costs discourage companies from cooperating in additional uh, jurisdictions um, pursuant to that, to that strategy. Uh, the financial and human resources required for cooperation have become so great when you're cooperating with so many jurisdictions that with our clients, we go over at the outset exactly what those obligations are going to be. So the client appreciates what the costs of those um, 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 uh, requirements are. 
so we go over the, the requirements of document retrieval, review, uh, and production. The cost of document translation, which is very expensive in several of our cases that we have now, document translation alone is nearing tens of millions of dollars in each case because of the required translations. The internal company interviews that are required, company proffers and witness proffers, the company statement, an employee witness statement, employee witnesses and re and uh, employee witness interviews and re-interviews in multiple uh, jurisdictions. Each of which, of course, each of those interviews may require um, uh, multiple translators, um, as is the case when, say, Japanese or Korean authorities are questioning a witness that speaks Chinese and the Global Coordinating Council is English uh, or speaks English. So such an interview requires three different translators uh, in order to um, uh, conduct that interview. Uh, and as you go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction with more and more jurisdictions requiring interviews of individuals pursuant to cooperation agreements, those costs um, uh, really mount up. Uh, I'm going to skip some of the specific examples of just how difficult um, uh, those uh, cooperation burdens or how large those cooperation burdens uh, can become in order to jump to the second type of cost that there is in connection with uh, responding to uh, a, the cooperation obligations of various jurisdictions. And, and the second type of cost is business uh, disruption uh, costs. Uh, that's one that people don't pay much attention to, and yet it is a cost that has grown exponentially uh, in, in recent, recent years. This is the time of your, of your executives and your sales and marketing department people and the finance people to answer all of the hundreds of questions that you're going to get in RFIs uh, from the jurisdictions uh, with which you're cooperating. It's the time of the legal department uh, to coordinate uh, the uh, cooperation obligations in multiple jurisdictions. The time of employees to prepare for interviews or to prepare their witness statements in response to the requests of multiple jurisdictions. We have matters where executives over a period of months spend more time preparing for and engaging in cooperation with the enforcement authorities uh, than they do in, in actually um, um, uh, performing business functions. Um, your job, your job, daily job becomes working with the enforcement authorities. And that, that is, that, that's a huge cost. There's another type of cost, which is a global strategy cost, and in view of the time, uh, I'm not going to uh, cover that. Uh, but I also don't want anybody to take my remarks, um, uh, to misinterpret my remarks. I'm not saying that every jurisdiction doesn't have the right to request any type of cooperation that it wants in exchange for granting this tremendous benefit of immunity to a company and individuals. Of course, every jurisdiction has that right. Uh, but it's incumbent upon jurisdictions to appreciate that as more and more jurisdictions are placing heavier and heavier requirements upon those that cooperate, it's creating a burden, a cumulative burden, which may actually dissuade companies uh, from coming in and cooperating. And the last point uh, that, uh, that I will uh, hit uh, in terms of the challenges of the uh, internationalization of investigations uh, is managing uh, the civil litigation consequences uh, of uh, cooperation. It would be difficult to overst overstate the significance of civil litigation uh, considerations. How can I say that when I've just talked about uh, the huge fines that have been imposed in the United States on companies, uh, the jail sentences uh, for executives, uh, a reference to the EU, which has even larger fines, which uh, Michael will, will talk about. Why are the civil litigation uh, considerations so consequences? Uh, uh, civil 
litigation consequences so important? Uh, it is because, and many people who do not practice in the United States don't appreciate this, it's because that when there is a leniency application and the announcement of a cartel investigation, the leniency applicant can be certain that there will be many, sometimes hundreds, of class action civil cases filed in the United States. The class action private bar in the United, in the United States is very sophisticated. It is well organized. It is well financed. They have staying power that is afforded by their very deep pockets. But this is the important point. In all of the major cartel prosecutions over the last several years, the costs to defend and settle civil litigation in the United States alone has exceeded the total costs of all fines by all governments against the cartelists in that cartel. I want to make sure that everybody appreciates that and why people are so focused on civil litigation consequences. Let me put it another way. If you add up all of the fines imposed by all of the governments on the cartel participants in any cartel, in recent cases, that total has been exceeded by just the cost to settle civil damage exposure in the United States alone. And there's now also civil litigation exposure. And so given that, given that those involved in developing a global strategy as to what to do in international cartel cases focus like a laser on the costs of that civil litigation and avoiding increasing those costs. And one of the ways to avoid increasing those costs is by a focus on what is discoverable if you engage in cooperation with certain jurisdictions. And so as you go to, to various jurisdictions, you look at what are the requirements for cooperation. In connection with those requirements, when might a leniency application become public? When might the enforcement authority be required to disclose the contents of the leniency application? For example, in connection with compulsory process. At what later stage might that information become public? If it's not disclosed publicly, is it disclosed to third parties? Which third parties? How might that information get to private damage uh, plaintiffs in the United States? Uh, and again, because in the interest of time, uh, I, won't, I won't go through uh, the actual schedule of questions that we have as we go to enforcement authorities to determine whether or not there is likely to be discovery of the information that you provide to the leniency applicant. But if there's too great a risk of discovery, a leniency applicant will not go to that jurisdiction. There are currently jurisdictions where leniency applicants do not make an application, excuse me, where cooperating companies that make leniency applications in other jurisdictions do not make applications in a particular jurisdiction because of the potential discovery of the information that it provides. I will conclude by saying that at an, internet, that at an international competition network uh, workshop 18 months ago, there were five panelists talking about the most important considerations in choosing which jurisdictions to cooperate with and where to submit leniency applications. When the question was put by the moderator to the panelists, four of the five panelists, uh, people with um, uh, many, many years of experience uh, in handling uh, cartel matters, four of the five panelists said, the single most important consideration today in deciding where to seek leniency is how that jurisdiction handles the confidentiality of the information provided 
and whether or not it might be disclosed in connection with uh, civil litigation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, let me tell you uh, how we will proceed from now on. Uh, after hearing uh, Gary's uh, uh, wonderful explanation on the U.S. system, we'll now move on to Vasily Rodomino, who will give us the private traditional view in Russia. Then Michael Reynolds will uh, say a little bit on the EU system. I'll give you brief remarks on how Brazil is doing with cartel investigations. And then uh, we'll move to Andrei Tsarikovsky for the Russian uh, 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 authority uh, comments on, on this. So, uh, Vasily, please. Thank you, Jose. Good morning. Uh, um, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, for me to be here, and it's an honor to speak after uh, Harry. When he was talking about the international card investigations, uh, uh, you might have heard that uh, he didn't mention Russia. He said nothing about Russia. It's true that till recently Russia had uh, no active role in, in uh, international uh, cartel investigations, although we all know that uh, cartel investigations is one of the priorities in the uh, activities of the uh, Federal Anti-Monopoly Service, and uh, the uh, law enforcement uh, practice and application uh, have made great progress uh, in this country of late. So uh, I think that uh, uh, to uh, counter cartel um, uh, increments, uh, um, is one of the most successive areas where the uh, FAS operates. However, uh, it focuses mostly on the um, domestic uh, uh, cartels. It's in the um, uh, chlorine, uh, liquid caustic soda, coal, um, uh, uh, price fixings, and uh, other cases, similar cases. But looking at the general uh, picture, I would say that uh, FAA, uh, FAS and its head uh, director, Mr. I. Timiev made a speech recently uh, describing the uh, development uh, of the uh, service in the next years, and one of the objectives is uh, that the Russian uh, antitrust service um, uh, should be on the top ten list of the most successive uh, antitrust uh, bodies in the world uh, in the um, uh, rating uh, of the um, uh, global competition review. We uh, try to study uh, uh, the uh, operations and activities of the uh, current top ten um, uh, antitrust bodies, and uh, we realize that uh, uh, the majority of them um, um, are involved in uh, international investigations uh, and play an active role there. And we believe that uh, the success uh, of Russia um, on uh, uh, in this area, it depends uh, um, mostly on the fact if Russia um, uh, manages to become part of the international cartel investigations. We understand that it's not the only criterion, although that's a very critical one. If we succeed, uh, what we get, uh, how we can benefit of that? First and foremost, uh, uh, international cartels uh, uh, as uh, one of the most dangerous uh, uh, type of cartels, which uh, inflicts heavy damages on the international uh, uh, economics uh, and on the in economies and on the uh, economies of individual countries. And uh, if uh, uh, we are involved actively in that investigation, we will uh, certainly see if uh, we are really efficient uh, uh, in this area. On the other hand, to counter uh, uh, international cartels requires that specific institutions are shaped so that uh, special practices are put forward uh, that uh, I'm talking about uh, regulations, standards, uh, methodologies um, put together. They determine the level of sophistication uh, of uh, um, an antitrust body in the area. So uh, besides, uh, uh, as you may uh, uh, um, you might have heard, um, investigation of international cartels requires uh, a high degree of coordination, and coordination is possible only if there is trust and uh, reciprocity. And it shows, uh, once again, if uh, the um, anti-monopoly, uh, anti-trust body uh, is successful or not. And the involvement of international investigations can also indicate that bilateral relations uh, between certain countries are on the high level, too. 
So, uh, um, uh, um, and speaking of the FAS, uh, Federal Anti-Monopoly Service, um, I can say that if we succeed, uh, if we uh, become an active uh, part uh, in international um, um, investigations, then the service uh, will um, um, uh, become more sophisticated in determining uh, the organizers of uh, those uh, cartel uh, price fixing. And uh, we realize that uh, cartels uh, try to uh, avoid uh, um, acting in those countries where antitrust uh, um, uh, practices are on the high level and uh, where antitrust bodies are involved in international investigations. We need to point out that uh, um, emerging uh, uh, countries, uh, which Russia is part of, uh, m most commonly um, uh, I, uh, disclose uh, um, national cartels uh, uh, just uh, um, uh, only if it happens uh, uh, at the same uh, moment, at the same time. and. Um, and it, it, it's differ, uh, different from um, the U.S. or Japanese uh, practices, uh, which investigate uh, even uh, uh, the past uh, cases. However, if uh, uh, the country is not uh, involved and uh, the, the case is not disclosed, uh, then uh, and, uh, we have very few chances to uh, succeed in the future and revisit one or another case. And uh, currently, the Russian FAS uh, uh, does not have a reputation uh, of uh, sophisticated international investigation, and uh, that makes uh, uh, Russia belong to the uh, risk area and the uh, risk country. And uh, 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 in Russia, unfortunately, we don't have uh, expertise to investigate international cartels. And, uh, as I said earlier, um, uh, I uh, can only reiterate by saying that uh, the successful uh, role of uh, Russia in international investigations is a key to further development and sophistication of the Russian antitrust body. And uh, here, it is also very important that, uh, to say that the first investigations uh, uh, makes a signal uh, to uh, other antitrust bodies as, as well as to uh, multinational uh, corporations and companies that are part of those cartels. And that signal uh, tells them that uh, it's time to cooperate and uh, that uh, the Russian antitrust body uh, uh, feels like uh, uh, being very active in, the, in all the investigations. Investigations. So, uh, uh, if we get involved in international investigations, it, re it will really give a very powerful signal to all those uh, uh, companies uh, uh, that Russia is also involved and Russia is also alerted. Uh, another factor that uh, uh, Harry uh, mentioned um, is that uh, uh, the uh, fact of uh, international cartel investigations gives uh, 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 a chance to uh, companies, Russian companies suffered from such investigations, uh, file uh, private or uh, um, companies' uh, uh, suits. Uh, because uh, right now uh, that uh, opportunity uh, is not accessible uh, to Russian participants because uh, Russian antitrust bodies are not involved. Although uh, of those uh, cases that were investigated recently in the United States, uh, Canada, Japan, had a great impact on uh, Russian market and Russian companies. And, uh, and as an outcome, uh, it's the customers who suffer. So, and uh, lastly, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, if Russia is involved, uh, it will have a good impact on the positive impact on the investment climate in, in Russia. And both Russian and foreign investors will be better protected, and their investments will be better protected because a uh, negative impact of uh, cartels uh, will be minimized uh, um, in Russia. It's quite uh, obvious uh, uh, that all cartels can be divided into two groups. Uh, I mean, international cartels, and uh, those are so-called uh, um, cartels, uh, meaning uh, uh, 
price fixing affecting uh, several uh, jurisdictions and uh, the domestic market is only one of the jurisdictions and uh, as an example i can refer to uh, that LSD monitors case, uh, vitamin cartels, and many others. Uh, those are the typical international cartels uh, involving a number of countries, and that's a cartel that's uh, the hardest to investigate. And uh, the other uh, uh, type uh, of cartels is uh, uh, model international practices when uh, the parties to the uh, cartel uh, price fixing um, uh, use uh, standardized schemes uh, in uh, various jurisdictions. And uh, um, uh, we uh, can only su suggest that uh, uh, cattle um, uh, participants in this country uh, stick to the same schemes. And uh, those uh, uh, standardized practices um, can be um, easier um, investigated uh, than the international cartels, uh, specifically here in Russia, where we're only starting our international investigations. So, um, uh, so what the situation is like in this country uh, at this point when we're uh, approaching uh, um, and uh, our director uh, um, outline the strategy for the organization um, as uh, being more active in international um, cooperation. So what are the starting positions of Russia? I think the starting positions are quite good. Uh, Article 3 in this country on protecting fair competition suggests that uh, the uh, principle of ex-territorial um, prosecution can be applied quite broadly, and uh, it may have a positive impact uh, so uh, a Russian jurisdiction can be applied to any uh, actions and uh, acts that may affect fair competition in this country. So we don't have any legislative barrier uh, uh, to uh, protect uh, fair competition. And uh, that's, I think, uh, one of the most critical uh, factors of uh, possible success. Secondly, uh, here in Russia, we have a great experience in investigation of uh, national cartels, uh, which is also very important. And thirdly, in Russia, we have both <clears throat> administrative and criminal um, prosecution for um, uh, cartel uh, <coughs> participants. And fourthly, <clears throat> we can see uh, that uh, the antitrust, uh, the Russian antitrust body is uh, very active uh, in uh, uh, the cooperation with the police, uh, with uh, the Federal Security Service and the Office of the Prosecutors. So I think those prerequisites are quite uh, sophisticated in this country. However, there are some problems uh, which do not allow us to say that we are being ready to be involved in investigating international cartels. What are those challenges and problems that exist? Firstly, we don't have a clear understanding of how uh, to uh, uh, sue foreign companies are for violating a Russian antitrust legislation if the company is not present in Russia, if it doesn't have assets in Russia. I believe that uh, we need uh, to work on these mechanisms in the nearest future. We need to think about what other measures may be applied in these cases using the resources of uh, customs legislation, of tax legislation, and of other legislation. Uh, the other thing is that exists in our country is the statute of limitation. The statute, the period of limitation is three years in Russia. When this statute of, le of, legis uh, of limitation uh, expires, you actually cannot uh, start a legal action. It's very important for a com country which will probably follow in the steps of other legislations and other uh, 
trust bodies. The information uh, about other investigations uh, will be available in Russia later, uh, two years later, maybe several years later, and we will be able to apply the appropriate sanctions. Of course, we can use criminal sanctions because uh, the statute of limitation for criminal cases is 10 years. But the government uh, won't be able to fine a company, which is, of course, and a fine is a very important uh, measure, a very important mechanism. Another area uh, which is a serious impediment for the development of uh, cartel investigation in Russia is uh, the period of investigation. On the one hand, we are very proud that all the period of periods of investigations are very short in Russia. This is convenient, this is reasonable, and this is convenient for the companies that are involved in the investigation. On the other hand, well, and it also allows to uh, save uh, money, and it's are clear to understand. It allows to understand when the investigation will be over, but that undermines quality. We know that cartels, some cartels, have been in existence for 70 years, and more than that, investigating a cartel in a few months is next to impossible. It's next to impossible to digest the amount of information that is available to the antitrust authorities. And international experience shows that such investigations sometimes take years to achieve a quality result. And I think we need to change our law it is necessary uh, to make use of the experience accumulated in the United States and in Europe. Despite uh, the seemingly high fines, and that's up to 15% of the working capital, compared to Europe, those fines are liberal enough. We all know and research shows that cartels result in about a 30% growth in prices. So a 15% fine is already included into that 30% price growth. And we shouldn't probably think so much about uh, increasing the fines, but we should increase the fines for non-collaboration for uh, non-providing information. And certainly one of the most important problems is our leniency program. You've heard from Gary that the leniency program is the main tool in investigating international cartels. According to statistics, 75% of all the cases investigated in this area start with an application for a leniency program. So far, although we know that a lot of work is being done to improve this program in Russia, yet a full-fledged leniency program is absent in Russia. And because of that, I, as a practitioner, come across discussions whether one should apply for a leniency program. And most often, the corporate lawyers believe they shouldn't. So why don't uh, international corporations uh, prefer to participate in such programs. Firstly, there is a lack of clarity on many issues which are, uh, for instance, 
uh, there is a lack of clarity about uh, the completeness of information, about the uh, boundaries of the market, about the... Uh, uh, there are no clear-cut requirements for evidence. And thirdly, I believe that uh, there are excessive or redundant requirements uh, that the company that applied for the program should stop participa its participation in the cartel. Uh, that comes into contradiction uh, with uh, many laws existing in other countries. And if a con company stops uh, its participation in the cartel, it may hinder investigation. It's not also quite clear as of now, who is immune from responsibility? The company, the company and all of its employees, including directors. And as you heard from Gary, this is one of the main drivers. The clarity of who becomes in immune must be 100 percent. Then people will be motivated to use this system. The absence of the marker system also brings uncertainty into our leniency program. And it's quite clear that the collaboration between leniency in uh, criminal prosecution and in administrative prosecution must be achieved. I believe on the level of the federal and monopoly service, uh, we need to develop a better leniency program which will take account of the international experience and that will certainly allow us to accept that experience and give a clear signal to the companies when they analyze the possibility for applying for leniency. They must have an absolute clarity about the conditions. And the last impediment is the factor of opposition. Certainly, if Russia is seriously planning to be involved in international cartel investigations, one should understand that this demands a lot of labor resources, it demands a lot of experts speaking different languages, and it demands a lot of investment in the development of antitrust authorities. By way of conclusion, I would like to say that uh, fighting cartels is an integral part and a priority objective for our service. We know that international cartels are included into that objective, and we hope that in the nearest future, Russia will be more involved in such investigations. Thank you. Please give us the EU view. <coughs> yes. Uh, Gary has already indicated that the main means of sanctioning fines in the European Union is through fines. Um, there is no criminal or individual sanction under EU law. Um, that's mainly because of the constitutional position of the Treaty of the European Union, which doesn't provide for direct criminal um, jurisdictional powers on the European Commission, which is the main executive, and the uh, criminal enforcement generally is in the hands of the member states. So in the European Union, we have a situation where for breaches of the competition rules for cartel activities, the sanction is an administrative fine imposed on the company, not on the individual, by the European Commission. But you also have to bear in mind that individual member states in the European Union that have their own uh, cartel enforcement provisions, such as uh, Great Britain, Germany, uh, France, and a number of other member states, um, some of those countries do actually have criminal provisions which those individual member states uh, can 
in force. Uh, 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 for example, in, in the United Kingdom, we now have criminal sanctions against cartel activities. Uh, but uh, in general, it is an administrative fine. And under successive uh, commissioners for competition rules, the um, risks for companies of breaching the rules have grown, and the size of the fine has grown because there is a philosophy uh, that in calculating the fine, one of, uh, the, one of the components is a deterrent multiplier, something that will increase the level of the fine, which the Commission, under its finding guidelines, is able to do to make the fine so painful, so high, uh, that it will deter companies from this behavior um, in the future. Um, and to give you a few examples, I mean, the, the highest fine uh, that's in, been imposed so far on an individual company was probably in the uh, car glass case where a fine on a French company, Saint-Gobain, uh, was somewhere in the region of uh, 900 uh, million euros. And the, uh, the chairman of Saint-Gobain said that actually coming off the uh, bottom line of the company represented the budget uh, for research and development for about the next six years. So it's a huge fine on an individual company. I'll give you a few other examples on the Philips Corporation in the uh, TV and um, computer monitor tubes case, fine of 700 uh, million euros. Um, Hoffman LaRoche uh, in the vitamin case, nearly 500 million euros, uh, Siemens in the GIS switchgear case, 400 million euros. So those are huge fines. And they do also apply, of course, to companies that are not European companies, uh, companies from outside the European <coughs> Union that operate within the European Union are also subject to those fines. So, for example, uh, LG Electronics from Korea uh, was fined nearly 700 million euros in the uh, TV and computer monitor tubes case. Uh, many Japanese companies have uh, had to pay very high fines. Toshiba, Mitsubishi, uh, in the uh, gas insulated, in insulated switchgear case, fines of, of over 100 um, million euros. These are enormously high fines. It has proved really quite difficult to reduce the amount of those fines uh, on appeal. Um, and indeed, in Europe, many... Um, politicians and lobbyists have said the fines have now reached a ridiculously high level. They are damaging the economy. They are damaging companies have called on the Commission to take that into account. Uh, and the Commission, and particularly the present Commissioner, has have repeatedly said uh, that they don't think that even the fact that uh, we are in a, in a recession means that the Commission should be more lenient in its imposition for fines. So the prospects are that those fines are going to increase. We have ongoing investigations, major cases like the automotive parts case, uh, the LIBOR um, interest rates uh, manipulation case. Those cases are all likely to lead to very high fines of the magnitude that I've mentioned. And indeed, yesterday, uh, when you read yesterday's Financial Times, here you have yet another case. European oil groups raided in price probe. Uh, all over Europe yesterday, uh, commission investigators in dawn raids raided Royal Dutch Shell, BP, Statoil. Um, I'm actually told a Russian company is involved in this investigation as well. Uh, and uh, so these, these investigations are ongoing. And as I said earlier, one of the reasons that the Commission has been able to mount many of these investigations is international cooperation with other antitrust authorities, but the leniency program that we also operate in the European Union. Now, the European Union um, started its leniency program in 1996, really trying to copy what had been done um, in the United States. It was a very imperfect leniency program to begin with, it had many of the defects that uh, Vassil has just pointed out. It uh, was highly discretionary. There was no certainty that you would actually get immunity. It was very difficult to um, give the information to the European Commission without that information becoming discoverable <coughs> under uh, US civil litigation discovery rules. And so uh, it didn't work. Um, over the course of time, the European Commission has refined 
its leniency programme, and we now have uh, a leniency programme which I think works much better. Uh, it is possible to uh, present leniency applications um, orally, and special provisions have been made to do that. We now have a marker system in the European Union, um, and that's very important because under the European uh, Union rules, the benefits that you get do depend on how fast you are, how quick you are to get in. So if you are the first in uh, and are able to give the Commission evidence that will enable it to mount a targeted inquiry, you can get 100% immunity, and a number of companies have succeeded uh, in getting uh, immunity, such as uh, Micron, for example, in the uh, DRAM case. Um, if you're not the first in, you can still get a um, reduction in the fine, and that the level of that reduction will depend on whether you're number two in, or number three in, or number four in, um, and you may get a reduction of fine of 50%, 30%, 20%, graded according to uh, your the speed with which you've been able to get in. So the speed of getting in and making this decision of going in to get leniency is absolutely crucial. It can make a huge amount with these enormous amounts of money that I've been talking about, whether you are uh, number two in or number three in to get leniency. Um, we don't have as yet, although it's beginning, um, civil uh, damages, civil damage litigation in Europe. We don't have private damage uh, actions, but that is now beginning in Europe. Uh, nonetheless, the main concern in the minds of most companies is the concern that Gary mentioned earlier. It is your liability in the United States because many of these actions are also subject to litigation in the United States and therefore a key consideration is how far will your corporate leniency statement that you have to make, which gives a clear statement about the cartel and uh, the company's involvement in it, uh, how far is that protected? Uh, and so that has been a key consideration. The European Commission has gone to uh, quite a um, major steps to make sure that uh, corporate leniency statements are protected, or despite numerous attempts in the United States litigation to compel production of those statements. But the oral uh, mechanism for presenting leniency uh, has greatly assisted in that. So I think those are the main features of the European system. But as I say, it is a, it is a tough regime. The fines are going to get ever higher in these investigations that are now ongoing, such as auto parts. Whatever this oil investigation may lead to may also be enormous. So uh, it is very important in, in Europe for uh, Russian companies and other companies that operate in the European market to take account of that um, and uh, also to take account of the possibility, if you do get involved with a cartel, um, of the leniency uh, program that is available. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm sure we, we are all anxious to, to hear Mr. Tsakirovsky, but uh, although we are running out of time, I'll, I'll take just a few, a few moments, uh, and I promise to be really brief, to tell you a little bit about Brazil, and then we, we, we turn on to uh, Mr. Tsarikovsky. Uh, I think it is important for you to know that uh, also in Brazil, the fight against cartel is a very important and a, a topic of the moment. Uh, and, of course, there was a turning point in Brazil, as in any other jurisdiction, which uh, was the introduction of the leniency program, which took place in, uh, actually in 2000, but the regulation came in in 2002. So we are talking uh, about 10 years of leniency program in Brazil. And that made a huge change in Brazil, not only uh, on the uh, international cartels, and now, as Gary said, you have to consider Brazil whenever you are working on an investigation, on an international investigation, because the cost uh, uh, of penalties in Brazil are escalating in a, in, in a very steep way. Uh, but also, uh, uh, the domestic uh, investigations improved a lot in Brazil after the leniency program. So we have a two-way a two uh, uh, progress in Brazil, not only on the international uh, investigations, but also on, 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 on the domestic ones. Uh, the penalties uh, have been increasing uh, a lot in Brazil. Just to give you an idea, 
uh, one of the first major decisions in Brazil was on a steel manufacturer's cartel in 1999. And at that moment, uh, 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 the penalty imposed on the companies were 1% of their annual turnover. Uh, compared to the uh, 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 gas cartel that was decided in 2010, and on which just one of the companies, White Martins, received a penalty of one billion, billion US dollars. So that gives you a, a, an idea of how much the penalties are improving in Brazil. And also because in Brazil we have both the administrative and the criminal uh, 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 violations. So individuals also face uh, uh, penalties in Brazil, not only uh, administrative penalties, but also uh, 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 jail term. Uh, there was a major introduction in the law in Brazil last May, May 20, not this May, May 2012, a year ago, when we also, we introduced a new uh, 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 competition statute in Brazil, which made a, a significant change in terms of cartel investigations because we, we, we introduced several changes in the merger review, and because the authority in Brazil is understaffed, those changes in the merger review made room for the, for the authority to have more investigation and more time on the cartel investigation. But the other significant change was that up to last year, on the uh, criminal aspect of the cartel violation, uh, 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 the judges were allowed to impose on the individuals a penalty, either a pecuniary penalty or a prison term. Since uh, last year, now they have to impose both a pecuniary penalty and jail term. So that made a huge change in, in Brazil as well. Just to give you an, an idea, we have uh, right now 200 individuals facing uh, criminal persecution. Uh, we have four convi uh, 40 convictions, four zero convictions. Uh, obviously, they are uh, still under appeal. But uh, individuals are getting more and more scared uh, of uh, participating in a cartel in Brazil. Uh, and although those convictions did not result in jail term yet, we have a, a, a specific uh, legislation in Brazil that allows for the individuals, uh, for the, the authority to send individuals to jail at the beginning of the investigation if by some reason they uh, jeopardize the investigation or in cases where there is also a public bid involved and, and corruption involved. So we have several cases of individuals that were sent to jail. Of course, this is limited to 10 days, but they were sent to jail for 10 days at the beginning of the investigation, of the cartel investigation, during the downright period. So this is also very uh, uh, important in, in terms of Brazil. Uh, leniency, again, was a major turnover. We have uh, uh, protection just for the first one in so the companies uh, uh, involved in the international cartel have to run after that in Brazil. Luckily, we have a very efficient marker system, a uh, very simple marker system. You can get the marker by uh, calling the authority and informing about the, 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 the case. So this is also something that helps a lot. And uh, just to conclude, finally, another, another uh, point that is important in Brazil and especially because leniency protects only the first in, uh, are the settlements. Uh, we are more and more getting into settlements on cartel cases. That means a lot of uh, 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 saves, not only for the authorities, but for the companies as well. Of course, the settlement implies not only in the admission of guilt, but also in, 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 the, in the payment of, uh, of a penalty. But this is a, a new mechanism that is coming up in Brazil right now and making a, a, a lot of uh, 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 good points in the, in the fight against cartels. Of course, I, I had much more to say, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time. So, uh, Mr. Sarikovsky, please, you have the word.
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, dear colleagues, actually, I have uh, the entire presentation, um, but uh, um, PowerPoint presentation, but I don't think it's appropriate to use it uh, because uh, a discussion and interaction is uh, really more instrumental. And besides, my colleagues uh, put forward uh, most of uh, those uh, uh, points and aspects I was going to speak uh, about, and it uh, shows that uh, we are all thinking along uh, the same lines. On my part, I would like to outline three aspects uh, that may help to uh, counter um, the cartels. Uh, first uh, and foremost, uh, it's a leniency program since uh, mm, uh, it's uh, uh, those t uh, times in the past when uh, we were able to um, um, uh, really get uh, the specific results of investigations. And uh, most of the investigations are uh, retroactive, and uh, most of the um, uh, evidence uh, is destroyed And uh, by that time. Uh, the other principle has to do with the criminal um, uh, responsibility for cartel. Uh, uh, so unless uh, criminal responsibility is involved, then uh, financial benefits may overweight uh, the risks of administrative responsibility. And the third aspect uh, is uh, uh, international cooperation to counter uh, cartels. A uh, majority of cartels uh, are evolving as international. And uh, it's not the first time for me uh, when I see that um, many cartels uh, uh, leave the jurisdiction uh, under which uh, they are caught and uh, which they are disclosed. But it's naive for them to believe that they can succeed doing so nowadays because the international cooperation is evolving, it's uh, spreading. And I would like to speak of the three aspects uh, as they apply to Russia. First, the leniency program. I think it's uh, one of the main uh, principles and main machinery uh, in this area. And uh, Gary, um, I really, uh, it was really very interesting to hear uh, your story of the United States situation, and uh, and I can understand now that uh, you faced similar problems that we are facing now in this country. Uh, the matter is that uh, uh, once it was launched, nobody believed in that, and. Uh, uh, but uh, since in the first phases uh, uh, it was uh, quite a success, but uh, uh, we encountered two things uh, which uh, Vasily uh, had told us already. But uh, the, man is, uh, the thing is that we um, relieve from uh, administrative responsibility only under the program. Uh, we do not relieve from um, uh, criminal responsibility. So the company uh, th think that uh, they do not benefit benefit from that, and uh, if they um, apply to that and they prepare uh, all their um, um, arguments, and uh, those arguments may serve as evidence uh, uh, to put them to jail um, if they are persecuted uh, uh, under the criminal code. Uh, to uh, fix that situation, we uh, drafted some amendments uh, to the respective article, um, and um, we hope that once passed, uh, they will uh, help us uh, to relieve those companies from uh, criminal responsibility, too. And uh, our first uh, edition of the uh, Linian program uh, was valid uh, for uh, all applicants, and those who uh, who, who applied uh, um, were relieved from res responsibility, and that led to some comic situations when uh, we set up uh, some uh, um, absolute uh, um, uh, ever high uh, ever high um, a number of companies that uh, um, uh, really uh, um, announced uh, uh, their guilt. And uh, at one day, there were 54 companies who pleaded guilt and who applied for lenient program. So um, uh, it was really um, like a comic situation. And I think that under these circumstances, uh, the uh, Marx, com Marx comments about the EU pr uh, practice uh, is uh, more instrumental and more um, relevant, uh, and uh, I think we will come to that sooner or later. A lot of things apply to procedures, and um, Basile uh, tried to describe them, and uh, think that those are the problems that um, um, are the key ones. And Vasily also uh, spoke of a number of things uh, concerning uh, uh, durations, and uh, which I believe it is true. And 
Uh, it seems to me that both uh, uh, in this country and internationally, the period of limitation of investigations and duration of investigation should be ex extended uh, because investigations involve uh, a lot of volumes of uh, materials. And uh, I think if we uh, do not extend that, we will um, uh, impact negatively uh, a lot of parties involved because full materials can be, full evidence can be collected only by the end of the uh, investigation and uh uh, so the parties have no time to prepare some new arguments and uh, to counter the evidence, and uh, short terms uh, make uh, positions of the parties uh, worse. And one of the um, other important factors, and I'm speaking about law enforcement, uh, it's uh, uh, the um, uh, judicial practice, which is not stable here, which is not standardized. And it's a pleasure for me that uh, here in this room we have uh, people from the uh, Supreme um, uh, Commercial Court in, in Russia and uh, from the German uh, Ukrainian courts, uh, since uh, it's only uh, uh, through uh, interaction and uh, discussions of those things we can come to a single uh, opinion. And uh, given the U.S. experience, we know how, how many years it may take uh, to come uh, uh, up with uh, some single practices. It's next impossible to uh, do it overnight or even over a year. Uh, another very important thing, and uh, I have already spoken partially of that, it's the criminal responsibility and uh, uh, criminal prosecution. And I think that uh, unless we have it in place, uh, we cannot succeed uh, in this country. I've been uh, with the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service for many years, and people ask me if uh, uh, I'm not bored with that. Um, but uh, uh, my answer uh, usually is that I quit when I see f first uh, uh, a person convicted for cattle in jail, and uh, um, unless I see him in jail, uh, I will never quit. So, um, um, there is, uh, I understand that uh, we are lagging behind the schedule, but um, uh, I cannot but speak of the international cooperation. I don't think that any progress is uh, feasible unless uh, there is a strong um, and viable uh, international cooperation in place. And I think that uh, in addition uh, to Interpol, uh, there will be an uh, intercultural uh, body or something. And um, um, but to substitute for that, we need to ex expand our international cooperation. Uh, surprisingly, the uh, antitrust body people has, uh, become uh, very cooperative and flexible, and enables us to uh, join uh, effort. And uh, the Russian anti federal anti-monopoly service has uh, favored. Um, uh, the conclusion of many international and uh, commonly bilateral agreements. We have uh, a lot of them. We have a protocol with the EU and with the antitrust department, uh, the United States. So uh, we can really join our hands. Um, and uh, I think we are negotiating some new agreements uh, enabling us to uh, share information. Uh, uh, the main barrier here is uh, the confidentiality of information. And probably it's time uh, to think of some new agreements uh, that uh, would allow us uh, uh, to um, um, work out some rules for the refuse of uh, confidentiality restrictions. Uh, so when uh, 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 one of the parties may refuse uh, uh, some uh, restrictions, uh, and uh, it um, uh, will um, help us uh, to um, uh, streamline um, our cooperation. So uh, unless it is achieved, uh, um, uh, we will not uh, have a final success. And uh, although uh, it's pleasant for me to point out that um, uh, uh, Mr. Lynchov, who is uh, one of the bosses in our antitrust department, is here, and uh, we are working on that. And. Uh, we uh, do a lot in the fish industry, in the container shipments, and uh, and uh, we joint hands, a joint effort with uh, our Norwegian counterparts. And uh, in Norway, we we had our uh, full uh, full fledged session, of, and uh, uh, it helps us a lot with the information we get from them. 
And uh, it's what is most pleasant for, for me is that we think along the same lines, and uh, if we uh, really manage to join hands, uh, we will uh, make a lot of progress. And uh, uh, it's good that we started our day by reading an article from the Financial Times. Thank you. Uh, we we are running uh, out of time, and but. but if we have any questions from the floor, uh, we'll be glad to, to take any questions. I have to say that Mr. Spratling has a flight to catch, so he'll be leaving in 10 minutes. But any, anyway, we still have some time. So if you have any, any, any questions, uh, we'll be delighted to. Yes, one there. I'm Sergei Pozarevsky from the Federal Antimonopoly Service. Mr. Spotling, I have a couple of questions to ask, if I may. First, uh, I wonder if uh, uh, the organizer of the cattle uh, can be relieved from the responsibility if other cattle participants uh, uh, just uh, obeyed to, to uh, his orders or her orders were reporting to him. And my first, uh, second question, um, I wonder if an international cutter can be prosecuted uh, under the U.S. jurisdiction if uh, they never operated in the territory of the Russian uh, of the United States. Your second question first, uh, because I actually couldn't hear all of your first question. The translation I didn't hear at all. Uh, but uh, your second question, uh, whether or not uh, they uh, operated within the United States is not a requisite for uh, prosecution uh, by the United States authorities. There must be, jur they, there's two types of jurisdiction, obviously, subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction. The subject matter jurisdiction uh, 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 is gained any time the effect of the conduct has an impact on commerce in the United States. So the fact that all of the cartel conduct took place outside of the United States and that all of the individuals are outside the United States does not matter with respect to whether or not the United States would assert jurisdiction over the conduct uh, if there was harm to United States commerce. The, the question which would depend upon the fact situation in each case uh, as to whether or not the Department of Justice would try to bring a prosecution would be personal jurisdiction. Is there any way that the Department of Justice could get personal jurisdiction over a company that was not operating uh, in the United States? And that depends upon uh, that depends on the facts of each situation. Uh, did any of you hear the first question? Uh, if the individual can be waived to charge because he was following orders of the company. Oh uh, no, no. Uh, the, the, uh, I now understand your first question. Um, uh, there, there, uh, there is uh, no provision uh, for excusing the conduct of an individual who is acting pursuant to the instructions of a superior. Um, certainly the Department of Justice could exercise prosecutorial discretion to not bring a case against that individual. Depending upon the circumstances and, uh, of uh, his employment and whether or not the instructions were actually coercive, as distinguished from instructions such as, it would be in your interest, uh, Mr. Subordinate, it would be in your interest if you, if you called up our competitors and worked out the price at which we will each submit our bids. Uh, and so that's a type of instruction coming from a superior where an individual believes that it's in his interest to follow the instruction and might assert to the enforcement authorities, the reason I did it is because I was told to do it. The enforcement authorities, in the majority of cases in the United States, will still prosecute that individual because the individual had a choice 
as to whether or not to engage in a felony violation of law in response to a request or an instruction from a superior, just as an individual would have an opportunity to say, no, I'm not going to go rob that bank because you told me to rob the bank. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and so you will, you will see in many cases, um, especially um, uh, when foreign companies are involved, that individuals will assert the defense that it was a part of doing business or they were required to do it as a result of their instruction, uh, but the defense is not successful under United States law and oftentimes is not successful in persuading the Department of Justice to not bring a case against that individual. Is the person who arranged the cartel and coordinate and the key person who was the boss of the cartel can be released from responsibility or he must? Manage cartel. Uh, do, do you mean in a leniency situation? When somebody who managed the cartel, yes. who was the boss of the cartel, but then he applied to the commission, can this person be released? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the um, the commission is actually more clear on this in the um, uh, in their statement in their leniency statement than the United States is in its leniency policy. But the United States is equally clear with respect uh, to the ultimate result. Uh, and thank you for clarifying the question. Um, the individual who was the biggest actor in a cartel can get leniency and be excused from the conduct. The company that was the most, that was the biggest player in the market can apply for leniency and get leniency. To my knowledge, that's true in most jurisdictions, not just the United States. The exception is, is whether or not the individual or the company coerced another party to engage in the cartel. If you coerce, then that's a disqualifier. It's expressly so in the European Commission it is, it is so by statement of policy in the United States. And it's true in most leniency policies around the world. But it requires coercion. The fact that you were dominant, the fact that you were the major player, the fact that you, that you um, 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 uh, were the primary actor throughout the years of the cartel uh, will, not, will not disqualify you. In some jurisdictions, if you initiated the cartel, you are disqualified. That's not true in the United States. It requires coercion to be disqualified. Uh, any, any other question? We have one more here. Nikolai Vaznesensky, a practicing lawyer. Uh, Mr. Spratley, uh, he, in Russia we are now thinking about developing uh, private actions in antitrust law, which are not well developed at the moment. Uh, at the same time, you mentioned that uh, civil actions is a very strong deterrent for companies to apply for leniency in the U.S. Uh, do you have any recommendations for Russia in particular which steps need to be taken uh, in development of uh, private actions in cartel cases uh, that will help at the same time companies to apply for leniency? What uh, problems uh, could be there if uh, companies face uh, civil actions and at the same time want to apply for leniency? Um, certainly, uh, uh, th there ought to be in every jurisdiction an opportunity for those who have been injured uh, to recover uh, their, their damages. 
the problem with the system in the United States is it has become excessive. Um, and um, the combination of treble damages and joint and several liability uh, has given to private plaintiffs a tremendous lever uh, against those who engage in uh, cartel activity. And uh, whether or not you believe in that or don't believe in that uh, depends upon where you uh, practice law and perhaps what side of the political spectrum you're on. Uh, but the uh, one, one key uh, is, that, and the commission is looking at this uh, with respect to guidelines uh, for civil recovery uh, in Europe. Uh, one key is, I, I believe, civil, civil damages um, and um, uh, some sort of restrictions on attorney's fees. Uh, so there's not the incentive uh, for um, attorneys to bring the cases uh, with the guarantee of a very large attorney's fees at the end. Uh, but another consideration is that which we already have in the United States, uh, which is for, for the leniency applicant uh, that there is no, no multiplier of damages for the leniency applicant. In the United States, as some of you probably know, uh, there is treble damage, three times liability for anyone that engages in cartel conduct. Uh, there was a statute passed in the United States which now limits that conduct, limits that exposure to single damages and only your own damages, which means no joint and several liability. That is a huge reduction on your exposure in the civil arena and greatly mitigates the concern about civil damage exposure to a prospective cooperator who is considering whether or not to come in and self-report and cooperate with authorities in the United States and, incidentally, around the world. Gary, if you allow, if you allow, allow me to add, I think there is also a cultural problem in Russia, that companies who have all the grounds to claim from the uh, companies which are, decision is taken by FIS that they are guilty, but still, the companies who have all the grounds are not exercising their right and not claiming the, dam the, the, the damages. We've passed several times, in my, I pra in my practice, I've passed several times discussions with the clients whether to claim within the private action, and in most cases, they were saying no. Mm -hmm. The practice is not forming in Russia. However, we have all the, let's say, grounds to do it. And I think it's a cultural problem. You know, on the point of cultural problems, it's something that should be mentioned because we don't have a representative of uh, Japan or the JF, uh, that is a Japan practitioner or uh, a representative of the JFTC. Uh, but the experience in Japan uh, is one of the most remarkable experiences uh, in the uh, international cartel arena and in the leniency arena. Um, for years, um, uh, it was predicted uh, that the leniency program uh, would not have any applicants in Japan. Uh, and for years, uh, there were no um, uh, leniency applications to the United States under its leniency program from Japanese companies. And people said it was because there was a cultural problem, that in Japan, people would not come in and turn one another in. It was a loss of face, a loss of reputation, it, 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 was, it, it, was, it was not the right thing to do. Uh, and yet today, uh, I forget what the statistics are, but there are, there are very large numbers of leniency applications uh, to the JFTC. Uh, when the program started, the, you may have heard that the fax machine, uh, the fax machine they actually had trouble with the fax machine because so many applications were coming in. Uh, and in recent years, um, uh, the companies, uh, Japan companies, have sought leniency from the Department of Justice, which meant turning in other companies in Japan, um, and um, individuals have also sought the protection of leniency uh, in the United States uh, under the leniency policy. So, uh, cultural, uh, what I'm suggesting to you, taking too long to do it, uh, what I'm suggesting to you is uh, cultural taboos can be overcome, but they need to be overcome through the, through the methods 
that we have suggested with respect to leniency programs. The only way they're effective are you have to have strong penalties, you have to have a fear of detection if you don't, if you don't come in, and you have to have, as you suggested, Vasily, uh, as you suggested, you must have predictability as to what's going to happen once you make an application. One more question and uh, we'll finish. Yeah. Tatiana Kaminska, a competition lawyer. The question will be in Russian. Gary, the question is to you. What do you do in a situation when in a country with which you don't have an international agreement, there is a cartel which impacts the U.S. economy? How do you manage to get evidence of such a cartel from that country, from the authorities of that country. Uh, you mean if I was with the Department of Justice? Uh, the, uh, um, the, um, it depends on whether or not the, uh, the country has a leniency policy. The country has a leniency policy in most jurisdictions, there is, there is also a principle of, of waiver. Uh, and so if the country had a leniency policy, and the United States also obviously has a leniency policy, and the applicant was seeking leniency in each jurisdiction. It's not about leniency program. Yet, uh, I think you. I mean, I meant. Uh, and the situation when you haven't got uh, with, uh, the, with the country international agreement uh, and uh, the cartel that is organized. And the cartel that is organized in that other country impacts the economy of the United States. But let's take, let's say it's an African country, but you don't have an agreement with that country. How do you get the evidence of the existence of such a cartel in such a country from the authorities of that country? You, 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 can, you cannot get them. Uh, well, you're assuming that there's no MLAT, there's no memorandum of understanding. Yes. And there is no cooperation agreement between the antitrust authorities. Between, right. the, yes, between states. So if, those, if, if you don't have any of those, the only way you can get the information is from the cartel participants themselves. Mm, okay. Because you cannot, because in nearly every jurisdiction that I know of, the information that is obtained by compulsory process from one jurisdiction cannot be given to another jurisdiction just on that jurisdiction's request, even if they, if, even if they wanted to. So uh, you are right. In that situation, you cannot get the information. And in fact, that was the problem for the, the United States Department of Justice in the prosecution of De Beers uh, for, uh, di for, for in, in the Diamond cases uh, many, many years ago. It could not obtain information from other jurisdictions uh, because uh, there was no method by which uh, to transfer the information. Well, yeah, uh, maybe I would add to that. Unfortunately, yes, that's a big problem. There are no methods for transfer of direct information. However, within the framework of collaboration of agencies, certain assistance may be rendered and a certain information uh, that is not confidential may be transferred. Uh, in the example with Norway, we did not get any information about the case, but we had an opportunity uh, to get some information from the antitrust authorities of Norway. And after that, we are coming to having an agreement with Norway. And what we are seeing in practice, that the antitrust agencies, in these cases, directly send a request to the company. And of course, there are companies that ignore such inquiries. But most of the companies, especially public companies, 
I mean foreign, in foreign jurisdictions, well, not in Africa, but in uh, America and Europe, in Asia. And most companies try to cooperate because they understand what sort of responsibility there may be. And although they do not have assets in Russia, they presume they might come to Russia in a few years. And the questions that are being asked of them now may be asked in Russia when they come there. Well, uh, we are out of time now. Uh, I would like to ask you to join me in a round of applause for our speakers here today. Thank you so much.